All right, welcome back everybody. As we continue to celebrate women all week and cover the topics and issues that affect women, we are speaking this morning about uncovering breast cancer. Joining me in person this morning is Dr. Asante Lebla, no stranger to the set here. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, Kerry. And uh, joining me as well via Zoom, it is a cancer survivor and her name is Colleen Bruno. Colleen is also a certified mastectomy bra fitter and we're going to find out from both individuals who I'm going to be chatting with now about the importance of, uh, well, uh, screening for breast cancer and the things that surround that as well. Good morning again and welcome to both of my guests. Good morning. Good morning, Kylie. Good morning, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning Doc. <laughs> Let me start with you, uh, Dr. LeBlanc. Now, breast cancer is one of the leading causes of mortality in women and uh, when it comes to cancer. And um, one thing we want to ensure is that as many women as possible get screened in time because that is literally the difference between life and death. Tell us about what the screening process is like for breast cancer. For breast cancer. Um, thanks for having me, by the way. Um, so the screening process starts even before 40. So it's important, first of all, for women to know their family history because that's a very important fact to understand if you have females or males in your family who've had breast cancer. Um, we also, we like to educate women from a young age, even from when they hit puberty, the young girls, on their self breast examinations. So that goes with our menstrual cycles. And so we educate them on when to check their breasts to understand what you're looking for. So look at your breasts, look at the size, look at that they're equal, relatively equal, because nothing is ever fully equal. Right. Um, look at the skin, look at any changes, and then palpation of the breast or feeling, touching of the breast and examining. It's important for a woman and a young girl to understand the architecture and what they're feeling about their breasts because that changes with time. Right. And so it's very important to understand what you're feeling so that when something new arises, you're able to go to your physician and say, something new is there. Then we have the annual clinical breast exam. So that's where you go into your family doctor and they do their, the physical exam, the clinical exam of your breast. And then from the age of between 35 to 40, but we, we advise right now with the Trinidad Bayo Cancer Society, from 40, a mammogram. So everybody's fearful of the mammogram. When right. they hear mammogram, they think pain, they think all kinds of things. And why, why is it associated with pain? Because of the, the, the myth spreaders out there. But also, a mammogram involves basically two plates coming right. down on your breast in different positions. Now, right. you don't have much breast for that to happen, so you wouldn't know, but that is uncomfortable. Okay. Because we have to compress so that we can see the architecture of the breast and they do it in different positions. Uh, when it comes to women who are very flat chested, uh, how is it done? Right, so we, depending on the, 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 the size of the breast, we do have plates to match the size of the breast. Okay. But also, um, we also will bring together with the mammogram, the ultrasound. Right. So if a woman definitely has breast tissue that cannot go under or go into the plates, then we will use the clinical breast exam and the ultrasound. But with other women, we use the mammogram, the clinical breast exam, the ultrasound, and your self-breast exam for screening for breast cancer. Now, Colleen, you yourself are a breast cancer survivor of uh, yes, over 10 years. And you, this is not uh, new information to you, but could you tell us about your experience and your journey from when you were first diagnosed to where you are today? Okay, good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. And thank you guys for having me this morning. When I was first diagnosed, it was, I will tell you straight up, it was like years before because I felt the lump and by doing ultrasound and mammogram, the lump, as they would tell you, the doctors would tell you, is fibristic tissue. And because it being fibristic tissue, there wasn't anything for you to worry about. Right. So telling you there's nothing to worry about and this thing is happening in you, you decided, okay, well, after two years of having nothing to worry about when I did decide it because the lump grew within the two years. And when um, I felt sick and by feeling sick, I decided I even fainted when my period came in that particular January month of 2011, when my period came, it was very heavy and all that. And I decided I fainted. And my husband took me to the doctor and the doctor now 
check the, actually I didn't even want the doctor to check the breast because it wasn't anything for me to worry about, but my husband told me, let the doctor check the breast. And I call the doctor checking the breast with the same lump that is fibroblastic tissue that I don't have to worry myself about. It's a very hard lump now. And the doctor sent me to do the mammogram and ultrasound. And they didn't even get the, actually, I would say the results yet because they had told me I needed to get, upon the mammogram, I still needed to get an biopsy done and that biopsy would have been like a C-reactive biopsy and that C-reactive biopsy was, was going to cost me a lot all right that same test that Dr. Labar said the mammogram and the ultrasound the mammogram is really I don't really think a lot of people really should be careful about it because it's something you need to find out and if you don't find it out it's really going to be devastating on you when you do find it out, which I will say happened to me because of the telling me it was just fibroblastic tissues. Now, uh, Dr. LeBlanc, um, what I'm drawing from this is that she would have gotten an early assessment and that assessment would have been, for the most part, incorrect because what it developed into afterward, um, it seemed more serious than not something to worry about. Um, how... Well, I, I know you wouldn't be able to tell me these statistics and, and stuff, but how can it be misdiagnosed? So um, I don't know Carlene's full history. Um, she is a member of our survivor group at the Gan Society. But what happens is, um, as she mentioned, fibrocystic breast disease. So a lot of women, um, especially younger women, can have fibrocystic breast disease, but also dense breast tissue. Right. And so what happens is you may see a, le a lump, um, but we look at the characteristics of the lump. So if it's well defined, if you look at different characteristics, and right. so the radiologist is the one who ultimately says and decides, is this does this have enough characteristics that are suspicious? So that is why. So it it may not be that she was misdiagnosed. Okay. It may be that the change did not happen while she did her mammogram. Right. So why I'm saying is that it may not be misdiagnosed is that at the end of the day we have to see what stage she was diagnosed at. And so we know if it was really early detection or was it missed. Right. So it is possible that you see a lump but the breasts are very dense or, and the radiologist says it does not look like that. There is a certain percentage of um, sensitivity and specificity in the tests. Um, but it, I mean, it's, it's somebody's eye. It's a right. human being. Right. So that's why we always tell women to listen to their gut and their, you know, their intuition. Right. So for example, in Carlene's case, she was reassured, and I, I can't blame her. I, I would have felt great, too, if a right. doctor told me twice that yeah. I was fine. Nothing to worry about. But right. I can't blame the doctors as either because we're using all the tools that we have at our disposal at this time. And if the lesion does not have a certain characteristic, right. then you won't say, go and have a biopsy because you don't want to put a woman through that emotional stress. But I really don't know the, the, the details of her diagnosis. Of course, of but course, yeah. most times I find that, that more, more often than not, I find that radiologists are now very, they, they err on the side of caution. And so they put very distinctly, maybe you should retest. Clinical correlation is important. So that, what does that mean? It means that Carlene's doctor, her family physician, or her gynecologist also had to know based on the results of the mammogram and the ultrasound, what was Carlene feeling? Right. What was her family history? Did she present risk factors? And then bring that together to determine the way forward. And yeah, because it's a whole complex web of information to uh, really weave together, to get the full picture, picture and uh, you know, make the right assessment. Um, before we go, um, so we spoke about the mammograms and such and the self-examinations. Is there anything else that women, especially younger women, um, should be doing you know, as you know, their first line of defense or at least finding out more about their body, especially their breasts? It's important to understand that cancer is classified as a lifestyle disease and it's one of our NCDs. And as you heard the Prime Minister state at CARICOM, NCDs or non-communicable diseases are the leading cause of death and our mortality in the Caribbean. So what does this mean for us as a society? It means that we have to start very early to practice what we preach when it comes to lifestyle. Right. To understand that exercise, eating a healthy, balanced diet, which is a huge topic in the Caribbean, because this means we now have to retrain ourselves right. to eat what is culturally 
ours. We have to retrain ourselves to really and truly eat local. But not only that, look at the chemicals that are involved in your local agri-processing and agri-industry. We have to look at the quality of food that we put into our bodies, our stress coping mechanisms. No smoking, no vaping, and, and I'm very clear right. on that. We're right. all clear on that, yeah. that there's no ands or gray area when it comes to vaping. It's no. Right. The answer is there. No excessive alcohol intake. So I've said no, but I've said excessive. So you can have a little alcohol. I know people will be happy about that, right. but not excessively. But not excessive, uh, you um, know, as is the culture here sometimes. Egg, well, you know. Uh, um, doctor, <laughs> I do have to stick a pin in it there because yes. we do have to take a sharp um, cut for the break. But I want to thank you and I want to thank Carleen Bruno as well for joining us this morning and giving us this information um, as we continue to bring the issues to light and we continue to give the information that is necessary because that it could actually save a life. So I want to thank you so much, Dr. Asante Leblanc. Thank you for, for joining having us this morning. Us. I want to thank you as well, Carleen Bruno, for joining us as well. We're going to take a short break and come back with much more. Up next, it's Bra Fitting here on the Normal Nation.